Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, June 30th edition of the Basement Academy. End of the week is end of the month, and it is the end of our five-week series uh, on where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Um, We'll take, uh, the Basement Academy is going to take the month of July off, and we'll resume on Monday, July 31st, so technically not the whole month of July. But uh, take the next four weeks off. We'll have something on replay. Uh, Not sure exactly what yet, but um, uh, feel free to take a break. (laughs) Uh, But there will be something on replay that will hopefully be edifying for you. And we'll pick back up on Monday the 31st, okay? Uh, Let's uh, begin with our morning psalm. Psalm 90. Love, 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 love this psalm. Great language uh, at the end of the, the psalm about God establishing the work of our hands and seems so appropriate on everything we've been talking about. Uh, This is the only psalm that is attributed to Moses. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger? For your wrath is as great as the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Mm. Amen context probably feels like the desert (laughs) the wilderness years as many years as we've seen trouble and affliction and experiencing the wrath of God his punishment upon those who rebelled against him so may the Lord establish the work of our hands may we bear fruit in our labors uh, for his glory and may we use that which comes from the work of our hands uh, for his good purposes, uh, strengthening our families, serving our communities, and helping to build the kingdom. <clears throat> okay, gone through a several pastoral and practical considerations, and so we'll finish here. Do not, <clears throat> excuse me, do not ignore the words of Jesus. Let's end where we began, beginning with uh, the reading from Matthew 6 about treasure, where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth, but treasures in heaven. You cannot serve two masters, two lords. You cannot serve both God and money. And so we do well to to remember the words of Jesus, to pay attention to the words of Jesus. But these are not the only words he's spoken about money. In fact, I think what I'll do, 
probably roll it forward several months, but I'll, I'll come back to this topic and do a couple weeks on the teachings of Jesus and the Gospels around money. But there's the parable of the man who felt like he needed bigger barns. The harvest was great. He was uh, successful. Um, look at all that grain. Look at that, uh, all those fields. Tell you what, I'm going to build bigger barns because I need more room for all the stuff I have. Nothing will trouble me. God says, you fool tonight. Your soul will be required of you. And so it's a parable that speaks of the folly of spiritual neglect, giving ourselves only to the things of this world, only to wealth accumulation, only to the harvest. He was a fool. He neglected his soul. You know, but I've got important things to do. And this is what happens. We get involved in our work, our careers. Um, it, it's important that we get to the office early and stay late and we do the extra projects and get ahead and, you know, get the promotions and make more money and keep advancing and, and, and. And sometimes what happens, again, not trying to scold anyone, just naming, I think, a reality, we sometimes neglect our soul. We, we begin to live by bread alone. We live as if this world and its needs and its uh, responsibilities and the, the money and the, uh, the, 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 the status and the responsibilities, all of this is what consumes our lives and we neglect God's word. We neglect our prayers. We neglect Sunday worship. We neglect our neighbor, sometimes the closest neighbors who are our family, our spouse and our children and grandchildren. And so Jesus tells a, a parable about a foolish man who only lived for accumulating. <clears throat> Jesus told about an encounter with a rich young ruler who was very interested in eternal life and the commandments of God. And uh, how do I inherit eternal life? Well, what what do you read? How do you read the, the, the word? Well, you know, I, I keep the commandments and he begins to list them off. And Jesus says, one thing you lack, go, sell all you have, give to the poor and come follow me. And with that, the man went away very sad because he had great wealth. Now, we don't know the rest of the story. Did he ever follow Jesus? We, we don't know. But it stands there as a warning, <clears throat> it's in that passage, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then that's where Luke says, you, has Jesus saying, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God to money. So, so Luke and Matthew both have the punchline. Matthew has it in the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Luke is a standalone, this encounter with the rich young ruler. Money had become his God. Oh, he was interested in the Bible. Oh, he was interested in the law of Moses. Oh, he was interested in the commands. But one thing he lacked, a free heart to follow God. Because for him, meaning and purpose was wrapped up in his wealth. And so he went away very sad. He did not, I, 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 can't, I can't separate from all, all, my, all my money, all my wealth. Uh, Jesus called the Pharisees out for their love of money. <clears throat> um, he, he points out the hypocrisy of their tithing practices. They tithe not just their money, they tithe down to the tenth of their spices, mint, dill, and cumin. So they are tithing. They're contributing 10%. I mean, imagine taking one of those red and white McCormick's spice jars, you know, those little shakers. Imagine taking one of those out of your spice cabinet and measuring out one-tenth of the spices and then bringing that to church. People will think, man, are these people serious about their faith? Nope. 
They were serious about performative religion. They were serious about getting noticed as people who appeared to be serious about their faith. And so as we have read in the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> when they gave their alms, they did it to be seen. When they said their prayers, they did it to be seen. When they fasted, they disheveled their faith, you know, their, their hair. They did it to be seen. And so they're tithing on their spices down to the tenth of the mint, dill, and cumin was to be seen. It was performative religion. Meanwhile, Jesus said, you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and righteousness. And so tithing is not the be all and end all. One could be so committed to tithing that you actually lose sight of the kingdom. And the Pharisees were tithers, faithful tithers, but they lost sight of the kingdom. We read in uh, the Gospels of the widow's might. She comes and throws her two pennies in, and Jesus says, surely she has given more than anyone else here because they give out of their abundance. She gives out of her poverty. But she was faithful. Friends, it is not how much money you give. It is not that. It is your sincerity, your attentiveness, your purpose for giving, your, your thanksgiving, your tribute, your gratitude, your honor, your worship of God as you bring any offerings uh, to the Lord. So please never, never let it be about the amount and do not become proud about the amount or do not be ashamed of the little you bring. God knows your heart. And so the, the example of the widow who gave more than anyone else, though it was the least amount, I'm sure. Uh, Jesus told parables that, that intersected uh, the parable of the shrewd manager who used worldly wealth to make friends. It's an interesting, strange parable. Eric's going to preach on that in a couple of weeks. Um, there... Uh, we're reminded those who are faithful with the little things will be entrusted with, with greater responsibility. Uh, the parable of the talents, the, the master getting ready to go off on a journey gives to his servants his stewards. So it's not their money, but, but it's uh, managed on behalf of the master. Ten bags of gold, five bags of gold, one bag of gold. The one with ten goes out and invests and makes ten more. The one with five goes out and makes five more. The one who only had the one bag, you know, I know you're a harsh man. And so I, I buried it in the ground so you can have your money back. Well, you should have at least invested it with the banker so I could have some interest. <clears throat> and so wise management, wise stewardship, but really it's more about a relationship with uh, the master. And I think it's illustrating we give ourselves first to the Lord, like those Macedonians in the Corinthian letter, and then we, we give uh, of our resources. Um, Jesus told the parable of the treasure in the field and the pearl of great price. The kingdom, the gospel himself, right, is so valuable. It, we could sell all we have and go embrace Christ and we would still end up with riches. Um, be circumspect with your giving. Do not you know, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That is, again, this is in the context of the Pharisees, performative religion, performative tithing and giving. They wanted everybody to know how, how religious they were and how much they were giving. So they're, they're waiting till the special time when everybody's going to see them. Jesus says, don't do it. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give in such a manner so that your father who sees in secret, he knows. He knows your heart. He knows your motives. It's not about the amount. It's about the intent and the, and the love and the, the, the tribute and the worship that it's brought with. So let us be circumspect in our giving. And again, we honor that. There are maybe three people, four people tops who would know those who count the offering on Monday mornings in our finance administrator. Pastors don't know, elders don't know who gives what to the church, and we respect that. We don't want to know. Um, my left hand does not want to know what your right hand is, is giving. Um, you can't serve two masters, right? So Jesus 
we have to hear these words of Jesus not as a scold, not as a harangue, as a loving warning. Money has such a prominent role in our lives, and it's even more so now. I mean, that that early economy, there was some bartering going on, right? You could bring just the produce of the fields and the flock to uh, the priest for the tithe. We couldn't tithe in produce. No, we, we could, but it would be impractical. Our society is based even more on money than uh, it was the, the, the time of Jesus. And so how much more should we listen then to the warning, the pastoral, caring, loving, wise warning that that Jesus gives with respect to the power of money to want to control our lives and and kind of lord it over our hearts and and, and capture us. I've said this a couple times along the way, the way we break the power of money in our lives is to give it away. It feels good to give. You can't outgive God. That's that's not language in Scripture. The concept I think is there, but but those words are not there. But it's true. You can't outgive God. God has given us all. He has given us life. He's given us creation. He's given us His dear Son. He's given us His Spirit. He has given all that we have. You know, the the clothes, the shelter, the the food, the the money. God has given and given and given. That is the nature of God. It is more blessed to give than receive, said Jesus, quoted in the book of Acts. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. I don't think our world believes that. I think our world thinks receiving is where it's at. Children have to be taught this because they think it's, it's more blessed to receive. You know, the way they treat Christmas, the way they treat their birthdays. Only as we mature do we come to understand, oh, the Christ-like nature of life is the joy of giving. And so we break the power of money as we give it, scatter abroad our our gifts to the poor. If Jesus is a faithful teacher, and we at least say he is, right, we give lip service to that and we give credence to that, then if he's a faithful teacher, then his teachings that we've just gone through, some of them are to be heeded. They are to be attended to. They are to be learned. They are to be lived. And so we can't have this, oh, Jesus is a great teacher, but I go do whatever I want with my money. He taught many things, but he taught, he definitely taught about money. He spoke about money more than anybody else that we read in the scripture. Jesus is the only true Lord. You can't serve two lords. There's the Lord Jesus or Lord Mammon, money. Serve the Lord Jesus. He is the Lord who liberates you. He's the Lord who sets you free. He is the Lord who who stoops to serve, to wash your feet, to show you what true living looks like. He is the Lord who secures our lives, who provides for our lives, both in this life and beyond this life. He is the pearl of great price. He is the treasure in the field. He is the shield and the very great reward promised to Abraham and the descendants of Abraham. So as we wrap up this series, I I hope this has been profitable. Um, Let me invite you to go back and re-watch, re-listen at some point. Um, you know, I, I believe this is transformative material, transformative truths. Friends, this is not about trying to get money out of you. This is about helping you to follow the Lord Jesus, to walk in discipleship in the area of finances. Financial discipleship is what this has all been about. And I pray that your heart <laughs> the treasure that you, you, you have in your heart will always be where true treasures are to be found. And that is in the heavenly realms with our Lord Jesus. Okay, let's close in prayer and we'll see you on July 31st. God bless. Father, thank you. Thank you for the, uh, the blessing of these words of Jesus, the blessing of these five weeks that we've studied and reflected. I pray anything I've said today or any day that has been untrue, unwise, unhelpful, not profitable for building our lives. Would you cause that to be blown away 
with the wind of your spirit. But that which is good, true, and helpful, may like, like good seed, may it fall into the soil of prepared hearts. And may we bring forth a fruit that remains for your glory. And so, Father, watch over us till we gather again here in the Basement Academy. Uh, keep us in our lives. And Lord, provide for us in such a way that we may provide for others. May we be blessed to be a blessing to others. As we pray in the name of the Savior who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May God establish the work of your hands. May God establish your heart to be set free by the power of the Spirit and the gospel and the kingdom. And may you be blessed this day so that you can be a blessing to others. May it happen today and forever. Amen.